have it up on the screen here for you. We're blessed because we are so, so loved by God, and that love includes God's deep desire to speak to us, not just a far distant God, but a God who is near to us and then speaks into our lives. And that's why we treasure God's word. It's the inspired word of God, God revealing himself to us in it. And so we, uh, we give thanks to God as we look at this text, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. Listen to God's word as I read this. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. And I do, this, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Let's take a moment to pray. <clears throat> Father, we are grateful for your love for us. We want to know you uh, more. We want to know you in a deeper way, a way that really does continue this change, this transformation that you've begun in us. But bring it to completion, Lord. Um, And so use this day, this text, as we chew on these words, as we meditate on them, uh, that they would become real food for us, that they would change us from the inside out. By your grace, by your power, we know this. uh, We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to take some time just with this text today because um, kind of where we're at right now uh, as a church, which is... The fact that we are entering into this new season of the year where school's starting. Um, We have a lot of things that are starting to crank up. Um, Some new life groups that will be showing up here. Um, Programs that are restarting after the summer break. And so it's, it's always an exciting time because we see God moving a lot of different people to do a lot of different things. And that's always a blessing to see. Um, It's always on my heart as pastor um, to make sure that we remember why we do what we do because it's just real easy real easy for a church to feel good that we're doing a lot of stuff but God is not concerned with how much we do he's really concerned that anything we do all that we do is in line with is working in his flow of his kingdom for the mission and the purpose that God has given us. So this is a good time for us, before we launch into a lot of these things again, to remember why are we doing what we do, Um, and we come back to that basic purpose, our mission as a church, which we take the two greats in the Bible. So one's called the Great Commission, and it's where Jesus, before he ascends to heaven, after his resurrection, gives his disciples instructions. He says, so I'm going back to heaven to reign, but in my place here, I'm leaving you so that you will go as the Father has sent me. I want you to be sent as well to make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's what Jesus says. That's Matthew 28. That's the great commission. Jesus says, here's your mission. It's not to twiddle your thumbs and wait for heaven. It's actually to be very actively involved, very consciously aware that everything you do should be trying to, we summarize it as, make disciples or grow disciples or both of those things together. Make and grow disciples. That's our mission. That's our purpose. We put it on your bulletin. We put it back there. We put it as many places as we can. I try to remind us so that we know why we're doing what we're doing. This text is a really good text where Paul talks about making disciples. So wherever in our text you said, and you see it multiple times, Paul says, I want to win Jews. I want to win those who are under the law. I want to win 
those who are not under the law, Gentiles. I want to win the weak. Win, in this case, means to make disciples. And it's a different word than what you might think. To win does not mean to defeat another person. That's usually how we think about it. I win, and I get into that mode a lot. I'm a kind of a competitive person. And so evangelism can get really distorted this way, where it's like I get to win an argument against somebody who doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe Jesus is the way. And so we get into these arguments. I win. That's not what this is talking about. The word literally means to gain. I want to, Paul says, I want to gain disciples for the kingdom of God, but I also get to gain them as a brother or a sister. I get to gain them. It's not about winning, defeating somebody. It's about bringing them into the blessings that you already know if you're in Jesus. And if you're not in Jesus here this morning, we're glad you're here. We really are. I just want you to know we're not trying to be subtle about this. Our hope and our goal is that we can help bring you to Jesus, that you will reach a point in your life where you will decide to surrender your life to Christ and become his disciple. That's our mission, our purpose. We don't try to hide it, but we also don't try to force that on you. We don't try to get too pushy about it. We don't try to ignore or or disrespect you. And if you're here and you're just trying to figure things out, we're glad you're here. You come as often as you can, we pray. And you will, give, you will be given space and time to come to know Jesus. But that's our hope and our goal for you. So that's what we're about as a church. Paul lists this out. I want to do that with all sorts of people, he says. And the first thing I want to note, I want to note just three things here today about making disciples. And that is there is a, a priority that Paul gives to him, gives to this task. There's a priority of making disciples. There's a lot of good things to do, but he puts us at the very top, and there's also going to be the right heart motive behind doing it. And then Paul lays out for us in these few verses here an approach, a way in which we do it. Okay, so let me look at the priority here first. We know it's a priority because in just five verses, he says it over and over and over again, to win, to win, to win. This is important, he's he's really saying. In fact, this is the most important decision that you'll ever make in your life. And you will make a lot of important decisions. But none have the weight of eternity hanging on them, like this decision does. Paul says the whole matter of whether you become a Christian, whether you become a disciple of Jesus or not, means that eternity is going to be determined by your decision, by your choice. So, of course, this has the highest, should have the highest ultimate priority because what other decision has that same weight to it? None, Paul says. Where you decide, in terms of your relationship with Jesus, decides where you're going to spend eternity. And so the Bible's really clear. There's not multiple choices here. To receive Christ is to receive life. And it's to receive it by grace, not because of anything that you and I do. But simply because by his mercy, he says, you can't save yourself. Let me save you. I'll do all that's necessary, but you have to receive it. And when you're ready to receive it, you receive life. And if you don't receive it by neglect, sometimes it's not because you just, I I reject everything that you're saying is false. But sometimes people say, I'll get to that. Maybe when I get older. Maybe when I graduate from high school. Maybe... Maybe when I get married, then I'll get real serious about it. Maybe maybe after we have kids, maybe after the kids are grown, maybe after I retire, and boy, we just can kind of put this off. And it it doesn't grasp the reality of this is the most important decision you'll ever make, and there is a limited time for you and I to make it. There's limited time. I know we talk a lot about, well, when is Jesus going to come back? Yeah, when he comes back and he ushers in the kingdom and the culmination of the kingdom, judgment day, the the renewal of the earth, the new heaven and new earth. Yeah, when's that going to be? That sounds so far away. But just remind you, none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. None of us. So my time of choosing is limited. Yours is limited. Today, the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you want to take seriously this call. And the call says it's so important because it's about life or death. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath 
remains on them. The issue is that we don't somehow are born neutral and then work our way through life and then we either are for God or against him. We are actually born as sinners who already are in enmity against God. We don't want God messing with our life. And our first cry from the earliest point that we can do this as maybe a two-year-old is, that's mine. It's mine. And then we say that about our life. That's my life. Nobody tells me what to do with my life. And here John says, but to believe and receive the Son means you get life. But if you don't, then what happens is God's wrath remains on you. And why doesn't it remain on those who receive Jesus? Because the wrath that I deserve and that you deserve, Jesus takes on himself. He takes on God's wrath so that I don't have to and you don't have to. And now we're able to receive his life. So this is urgent. This is important. This is the most important thing. The issue then becomes for us is that when we begin to say it that way, we're like, oh, yeah, man, there's no other important decision. I mean, we're going to forget lunch today. We're just going to, we got to focus right now on this, and then we can get urgent, and we can get anxious, and anxious Christians are not very fun to be around. Let me just tell you that right now. Anxious Christians have a way about us where we just get real pushy, and it's like, no, this has to happen right now, and it doesn't have to. It always reminds me of Patches. Patches is Margaret's favorite dog, just a little dog that she has, but lifelong buddies. And she had heard that it would be helpful if you gave your dog a spoonful of castor oil every day because it makes their coat real shiny, gives them strong teeth. So every day she'd have this routine. She'd grab Patches, put him on his back, pry open his mouth, take that spoonful of castor oil and down his throat. This is for his good, right? This is what she's a loving thing that she's doing. She does this battle every single day. Patches does not like this at all. One day he's fighting enough that he, he struggles out of her arms, knocks over the bottle of castor oil. So Margaret goes out to the kitchen. She goes to grab some towels to come back and clean it up. When she comes back, there is Patches licking up the castor oil that he has spilled because it turns out that he actually enjoys castor oil. He just doesn't enjoy having it shoved down his throat. And that is where we sometimes can take the urgency of what it means to make disciples and lose it into anxiousness. And we start pressing. And we say, no, you have to do it right now. And people are open to the message as long as we don't cram it down their throat. And so the first thing is have that burden without the anxiousness. God, make us a people where we can have that burden every single day. Honestly, most of the time I think our problem is we don't have the burden. Sometimes we're over anxious, but a lot of times we just don't have the burden. We have to see that truth, Paul says. Paul feels it. He says, I feel it every time I see a Jew, every time I see a Gentile, every time I see a convert to Judaism, every time I see the weak person, I feel this burden. God, give me the opportunity to share the gospel with them, to win as many as possible. So that's the urgency. The second thing is the heart. Verse 19 Paul says, it's a really interesting phrase, though I'm free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Let me just focus on that verse for just a second here. Let me start near the end. I've made myself a slave to everyone. So one of the first things to have the heart to make disciples is I have to really check how I view everyone in the broadest spectrum. Because what happens usually in our lives is we begin to put people into categories. You don't even really think about it a lot of times, but we put them into categories. Well, these are the kind of people that I understand. I get these people. They're like me. They have similar interests as me. They think along the same lines as me. They dress like me. They look like me. They eat like me. These are people I can get. But then there's these other categories of people like, no, they might look like me, but they think really differently. They might look like me, but they have some really different beliefs. And suddenly we have these categories, which happens naturally, but what also happens is we attach value to the category. And suddenly some people have less worth in our eyes because of things they have done or said. And one of the things you see right away with Paul is he's like, Here's my focus. My goal is that I will now become a disciple maker. 
I am a disciple who's growing to become a disciple maker, and I'm trying to look out how I view everyone. I want to become a slave, a servant to everyone, because everyone matters to God and has ultimate eternal value to God. And do I see people that way? Or am I more like Jonah? Because Jonah, in your Old Testament, he's a prophet of the Lord, which means this guy loves to speak God's word. He loves to go to people and say, let me tell you what God said. Let me share with you what the Lord has revealed to us. He loves to share God's word, just not with everybody. He loves to share it with the Israelites. Oh, of course, these are my peeps. These are the ones that understand me, and, and I'm, even if it's a hard word, I want to bring this word to them, the gospel to those folks, the word of the Lord to them. And then God says, that's great, Jonah. I'm so glad that you want to take the gospel to the Israelites. Here's what I really need you to do right now. I need you to take it to the Ninevites. Well, God, that's, that's a non-starter. That's not going to work for me. Why not? Let me give you the reasons. Because the Ninevites are the worst of the worst. They have conquered people and destroyed lives. They have killed people indiscriminately. They, they come into areas and they do the, more, the worst torture possible. I mean, they will take people and there was even records of, they would take people and bury them alive up to their necks in the dirt and then force them to listen to Miley Cyrus music. I mean, that's the kind of horrible, horrible things that they would do. And so Jonah's like, God, you can't be serious because why would I speak to them? They got no worth. They lost their worth. They had their shot. And they blew it by being such terrible sinners. I am not going to Nineveh to share the word of the Lord. And the question is, who are our Ninevites? Who, who are the ones that don't fit in the everyone category? Paul's saying, I want to go to everyone with this urgency that says also the heart that says they have such great worth no matter what they've done. Because here is a rock solid truth. You don't lose your worth by what you have done. You can't gain your worth by what you've done and you don't lose your worth. Sin does not rob anyone of their worth. The worth of a person is based not on what they've done but on who made them. The worth that you have as a person is based entirely on the fact that God, Almighty God, created you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He formed you. He brought you out and he said, I've given you a living soul. I created you unique in my image. You have great worth because I created you. Don't let the lives of the world, which puts value on people based on what they've done, if you're here today and you think that you've got no worth because if anybody knew my past, they would not want to hang around with me after the service, Cliff. If they knew what was going on in my life, they would want nothing to do with me because I have somehow knocked my worth down by really messing up. And no, you have not. So the first heart of making disciples is to say every person has great worth in God's sight and therefore should have in our sight as well. This is an issue of love. The reason that we make disciples needs to be because we love them. Doesn't mean you have to like everybody, but love is deeper than liking. Love is that full commitment that says, for your good, what's the best good? The greatest good is to introduce you to Jesus. The greatest good is that you come into relationship with him. And Paul does this freely. He says, I'm free. See, I'm no longer trying to find my identity and my worth by the way the world sets it up. I got it in Christ. He's revealed my great worth by what he's done, so I am free from that game. I don't have to play that game anymore, which means I'm now so free, I can now become a slave. And this is so opposite of the way our world thinks of freedom. If you're free, you don't give it up to become a slave now. You've just given up your freedom. Paul goes, no, I've got my freedom. I'm free to serve. I'm free to be a slave to others. So in our world, freedom means free to do whatever I choose, whatever I want. That's what real freedom means in our culture. I get to do whatever I want. That means I, I know I'm really free. Not really. Biblically, you know what real freedom is? Freedom, because the question is, if you're free to do whatever you want, what if you don't want to do it? 
Nobody ever asks the question about desire when it comes to freedom. They're always thinking outside. Well, I can just do whatever I want. What if you don't have the desire, the want, to want it? Are you really free? See, because you guys, you could say, Cliff, hey, come, we got this big buffet. We're going to set up all these foods. You are free to eat anything on this buffet. I promise you, I am not free if you put Brussels sprouts on that buffet. I'm not free. I'm not free to want Brussels sprouts. I do not like them, Sam I am. I don't like them on a train. I don't like them in the rain. I don't like Brussels sprouts, and I don't have a desire. I'm not free to desire them. See, that's what we're talking about. Real freedom is when you desire what you were designed for. That's real freedom. Not I get to do whatever I want and never asking the question, why is it that I don't want to do what I should do? I'm not really free. When you receive Christ, the most powerful thing that gets missed in the gospel, people all hear about the forgiveness of sins. You you accept Jesus, he forgives all your sins. Awesome, everybody wants that. Did you know you also get his life? That there is this union between you and Jesus. The moment that you say yes to Jesus, supernaturally the Holy Spirit causes you to be born again by the Spirit of God, and you are united to Christ such that all of your unrighteousness gets put on him, but then all of his righteousness and his life is given to you. And the Bible will detail this. It will say, gosh, you get not only his life, you get the mind of Christ becomes your mind. The heart of Christ becomes yours. And suddenly, you find this to be true. You start desiring things that you never wanted before. When you come to Jesus, you're like, I never wanted to read the Bible. And suddenly, there's this growing kind of desire. I want to get it. I want to understand it. I don't don't quite get it, but I want to. I have this desire to read it when I never did. A desire to pray. A desire to serve. A desire to worship. All of these desires are given to you by Christ, and now you're free. And you're not free until you desire that. You're like, well, that's pretty narrow-minded. What if I desire other things? That's like a fish. I know I've used this example. A fish could say, look, a fish is designed to swim in water. But you know what? That's really limiting because I'm a pretty progressive fish, and I'm looking out there, and I'm thinking, there's a whole lot of land out there, and I'm not really free Unless I can do whatever I want by going out on the land and not in the water. And somebody's like, well, okay, let's see what happens to a fish who's free that way. How is a fish free? Well, he's flopping around. He's beating himself to death. He's gasping for air. Why? He's not really free because that's not what he was designed for. You know that you and I were designed to swim in the love of God that that is what we're supposed to be breathing in. And every time we look to something or something else other than God to breathe in, to get that sense of worth and identity and purpose in our life, we're flopping around, beating ourselves to death. Real freedom is not just to do whatever you want. It is to do what you desire, what you were designed to desire to do. And so God gives us that in the gospel. So he says, as a free person, I can now serve other people because I have all of my basic needs met. What's my, ba- my worth, my identity, my purpose, secured by Jesus. I'm free to not worry about those things. I'm free to not go chase those things every day. I'm free to serve others who don't yet know him, to become their slave, to become their servant. In Jesus, we receive his life, his desires, and now we're free to serve one another. And I see this in our church. I'm always blessed around this time of year, especially because I get to see we're a very active church. And I appreciate so much that God has prompted so many of you to serve in different ways. Let me just call out one group in our church right now. And that is, we have a group that blesses my heart because I hear these conversations all the time. This is our retirees, okay? I don't know where you are on this spectrum right now, but we have retirees in our church, and they're like, oh, I can't wait till retirement because I finally will get some rest. I'll get a chance to relax. And it's no more than two months into retirement, and they are all, they are dragging themselves into my office. They're going, I have never been busier in my life than since I retired. I'm doing way more things than I ever did before I was retired. And you know what a lot of those things are? 
things that you would never expect a retiree to do, they say, you know what, I'm going to become all things to all nursery children. I'm going to sign up to help in our nursery child care. I'm going to become all things to our class students. And I'm going to sign up for class. Everybody's like, you're retired. I know. I am free. But I have made myself a slave to serve those who don't yet know Jesus. That's the heart we're talking about. The approach he also mentions. Verses 22 and 23. And this is the famous line. This is the one that most people have heard. Paul says, I have become... And there's a lot of confusion over this. We'll try to unpack this. I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. And I do this all for the sake of the gospel. So let's be clear. When Paul says by all possible means, he does not mean any sinful means as well or any compromising means to the gospel. What Paul has done and does consistently, and we need to do as well, is immediately recognize that there is a core, central um, truth of the gospel that has been the same since the beginning. It's never changed, and it can't change. If you try to change it, you've compromised your faith, you've compromised the gospel, you're sinning in some way if you lose sight of that. But outside of that, there's another way then you say, but how do I present, how do I speak to people about this unchanging truth of the gospel? And that does and must change. So the way that this is often talked about is that there are biblical norms, the truths that don't change about who Jesus is, the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Those things never change. But the way in which I present that to people, there are biblical norms that don't change, but there are cultural forms which must change for it to be understood. It must change to be understood. Our missionaries know this better than anybody. They have a nice little word for it. They call it contextualization, which just sounds like a big fancy word. It's basically saying, look, I need to be able to relate to the people that I'm going to speak the gospel to. And to relate to them, missionaries say, i got to train. Before I even go out on the mission field, I've got to go through training to learn what? i got to learn the language. i got to learn how they dress. i got to learn how they eat. i got to learn all the little intricacies of every culture that has them. They all have different kinds of things about this. Those things in themselves are not what I'm trying to change. I'm not trying to change their culture. I'm trying to bring a change to their heart by bringing them Jesus. That is where contextualization says, so I don't just go and try to make disciples without knowing my context and then trying to figure out what's the best way to tell them about the unchanging truth of Jesus. Biblically, you can see this play out. It's very interesting. In the book of Acts, if you get a chance to look at this, Acts chapter 15, Paul is part of a big council that happened at Jerusalem. The early church really wrestled with this one question, which is not a question for us very much. But in their day, first century, there was a big question on whether you needed to become a Jew before you became a Christian. And to become a Jew, the sign of that, the sign of the covenant, was the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision. Did you have to, if you were a Gentile, a person who was not a Jew, but now that you hear the truth about Jesus, do I need to get circumcised? Because God gave those commandments in the old covenant to those folks. Do I need to get circumcised first and then become a Christian? And there was a big discussion about that. Acts 15, you can read about it. Some people said, absolutely, you got to get circumcised. Paul and Peter and other disciples said, no, no. They do not because Jesus has fulfilled that covenant. He's fulfilled the law of God. And now the new covenant in his blood says that you can enter into that covenant relationship by faith through the grace that God provides. You don't have to get circumcised. That's how the council ends it, Acts 15. And all the Gentiles said, amen, that's awesome. You know, we don't have to get circumcised. Acts 16, right after this council happens, is so interesting. Paul says, I'm, go- I'm ready to go out on my second missionary journey. I'm taking some new guys with me. One of the guys is a young guy named Timothy. And you can read about it in the beginning of Acts 16. It says, Timothy, his mom was a Jew, but his father was a Greek. He was a Gentile. Everybody knew, because the father kind of sets the tone for the whole household, Timothy was not circumcised, even though his mom was Jewish, but his dad was not. And it says Paul 
has Timothy circumcised because of the Jews? And you're like, wait a second, Paul, did you forget Acts 15? Because you just made a big argument, you don't need to do that. And Paul's like, I know. But we've made ourselves slaves in our freedom in Christ. We're willing to do this. Of course, it's easy for him to say because it's Timothy who's getting circumcised. But he says, I'm willing to have Timothy do this because it's not going to help us not have a stumbling block in presenting the gospel to them. I don't want them focused on circumcision. He says in, the, in his letter to the Galatians, circumcision means nothing. Non-circumcision means nothing. That's not the point. He says, Jesus is the point. I don't want to get him stuck. The context, he says, says this. Better get circumcised, Timothy. Okay. That's partly what it means. And then you go to Acts 17, and it's interesting because Paul now is talking to a whole new group of people, not Jews. He's talking to Gentiles who don't have the law. And in Acts 17, he ends up in the, the city of Athens, which is a center for pagan worship, and there's idols everywhere and drives Paul crazy. He begins to try to share the gospel. He gets an audience with a group called the Areopagus. And this Areopagus is this highfalutin group of philosophers and leading thinkers. And they're almost like in a judgment mode. They're like, bring Paul in. We want to hear this gospel that he's preaching. And you would think, okay, Paul, God's opened the door here. Open both barrels here. I mean, just let them have it. Thou shalt have no other God before me. You're worshiping false idols. Do you know he doesn't quote from Scripture at all? It's all recorded in Acts 17. In his defense, he, he doesn't speak about the scriptures at all. In fact, he quotes two people, and they're not from the Bible. He quotes two Greek philosophers and poets. Now, he does connect it to the unchanging truth of the gospel. But he starts with where they're at. He says, they're not going to get it. I could quote scripture all day long. They don't know scripture and they don't believe that it's authoritative. Why would I start there and expect them to come and meet me? I, let me go to where they're at. I know that they know these Greek philosophers. And if I could help them to see that even there, these philosophers are pointing to a greater truth and tell them that that's Jesus. This unknown God you're worshiping. Let me tell you who he is. This is Paul's contextualization of the gospel. He does not compromise the gospel. He makes it understandable in this context. And we are called to do the same. I just got an email from one of our missionaries, Isaac and Amy Thompson. And they're serving with Global Partners in um, Spain. They're missionaries to Spain. And in the email, they're in this learning stage. They're, they're trying to learn the culture. And they wrote some really interesting things. They're like, wow, we didn't realize it, but from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in these big cities, the whole city shuts down. Like, there's no businesses open. You can't go and get anything. They said, our favorite bakery closes down from 2 to 4. And this, you know, we're just learning these things because everybody, sh it's the kind of the siesta deal. He said, nobody really goes into off and takes a nap, but it's so hot during that part of the day. People take extended lunches, and they just relax and visit from about 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And they're learning this. And I thought, if they don't learn this, they could say, man, we're going to do this great outreach program. We are going to do a great outreach in the city. Be there or be square. 3 p.m. We're going to have this great outreach. And everybody goes, man, you're going to get nobody. You're not going to speak to the people at all. That's not where they're at. you got to go to where they're at. And they're learning these other, <laughs> I, this, there's a Spanish word. I butcher this when I try to say it. But sobra mesa, they said. Sobra mesa is a Spanish word that means literally over the table. They said, we also learned that they eat lunch then about 2.30 in the afternoon. They don't eat supper till 9 or 10 o'clock at night. I would be dead. I can't make it past 8 o'clock if I haven't eaten something. And they're eating way late at night. And then he said they do this other thing. Sober mesa means over the table. They eat, and when they finish eating, they don't get up to try to clear the plates. They keep visiting, and they just keep visiting. Even at restaurants, they said. They'll go to a restaurant. This drives waiters crazy, but... They continue to just sit at the table after they've long finished the meal. Sober Mesa means over the table. It's definitely what I would call a Mary culture. And here in the U.S., we are a Martha culture. Because the first thing that we want to do is what? Let me, let me help clear those plates for you. And if we did that in that culture, we're not going to speak to them. So every culture has a way in which we can look at it and say, God, help me to connect. It happens in our culture. Look at how God's people contextualize the gospel. Ever heard of Fellowship of Christian Athletes? 
FCA? FCA is a way in which people have understood we are a high, we, we really put great value on athletics. I love athletics. I've always played athletics. Great. Guess what? That's a great way to connect with people where they're at. Fellowship of Christian Athletes is a fellowship for believers, but I've heard so many testimonies of people who said, how did you come to Jesus? I don't know. Some guy on my basketball team invited me to come to FCA. And all I knew was that it was athletes, so I was all in on that. And next thing you know, I'm hearing about Jesus. Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Christian Medical Association, Celebrate Recovery. There are, have you ever heard of cowboy churches? Cowboy churches, which basically say, look, there's a whole culture of people who are into rodeos and cowboys. We're going to reach out specifically to meet them where they're at. There's a Christian Motorcyclist Association. I know there's one, I think, in Concordia for that. And don't forget the CPLA, which is the Christian Pie Lovers Association. You can't forget that one. The point is this. If you're a golfer, reach those who golf. If you're a teacher, reach those who teach. If you're a knitter, reach those who knit. If you're a butler, reach those who butt. I mean, do whatever you got to do to say, what's my group? Where, where's my context? God's given me a context, and I want to be faithful because this is the ultimate priority, and I don't want to get anxious about it, God, but I want to be very conscious of showing them that the one unchanging truth of the gospel meets them right where they're at. It does. That some might be saved. The text says, Paul knows this is this. Hey, I want to reach everybody, but I know I can't. And here's the truth. Mark this one down. Nobody is able to reach everybody. But everybody, and I mean everybody, is able to reach somebody. Nobody can reach everybody, but everybody can reach somebody. What's your context? What's your group? Where has God placed you? Even Paul reaches a point in his ministry, you can read in Galatians 2, where he goes, look, I'm going to Jew and Gentile. But he reaches a point in his ministry, he realizes, but my primary focus, I'm not abandoning any other groups, my primary focus is going to be the Gentiles. And Peter's agreed to go to the Jews, and we're just going to make sure that we're always aware of the context that we're in that God has called us to. Can I, can I just, I want to speak to a particular group here this morning, not just our retirees. Can I speak to our young people here this morning? One, aren't they beautiful over here? Isn't this a great group? Yeah, it's okay to clap for them. Sorry, I'm doing the dad thing and embarrassing them right now. But here's the thing. I just want to speak to you guys for a second because you know what? Culture changes all the time. It always has throughout human history. And every time it's changed, the church has always tried to then adjust and say, God, help us to speak to this new context you've given us. But culture changes faster now than ever before in human history. And you guys are on the front lines of it. And we need you. We need you. I mean, honestly, most of us old folks, we're still trying to figure out our smartphones, right? You guys have an awareness of where God has placed you and the changes that are happening. And God has placed you strategically exactly where you're at to reach a new generation. We need you to think of how, God, you want me to share the gospel in this new context. We can't do this without you. You can't reach everybody. We can't. But together, God can do a great thing. So I just want to encourage you guys. I know school's starting again. This is your context, but God is going to do great things through you. Don't you doubt it. Believe it. God is going to work through you. Here's something else. One last thing. Paul names these groups, and they're pretty easy to find. Jews, okay, we get that. Those who are under the law, like, well, who is that? Isn't that Jews? Well, he's probably referring to converts to Judaism. And then he says to those without the law, that would be Gentiles. But then he adds this fourth category, the weak. He says, I want to become all things to all people, Jews, converts to Judaism, and Gentiles. And here's the thing, don't forget the weak. Because here's the thing. The weak in every culture, it's heartbreaking to see, but it doesn't matter what culture you're in. It could be a culture that's so different than ours, but this one thing is true. There's always outcasts. Always. There's always the people who don't have an association. They don't have a group that they're a part of. They're not part of the team. 
And they're always pushed to the edges where people are easily to oversee them. They, don't, they forget about them. And here, the gospel is for them. And Paul says, so to the weak, to the ones that the world looks at and says, oh, the poor guys, we don't want anything to do with them because they don't fit in. He says, make sure that you're taking the love of God to them. Make sure because that's the one group nobody wants. But God wants them. And if it's on God's heart, it better be on our heart. And you know what that means? How do, you, how do I become weak like the weak? I think you've got to befriend them. I think you've got to defend them. Those kids get bullied in school. You guys have a great opportunity to stand up for them. I'm not going to let that happen because I'm going to identify with the weak. And I'm going to defend them. And I'm going to love them. And I'm going to help them to see, yes, their only hope is in Jesus. But Jesus comes near to the brokenhearted to the messed up, to the ones that don't fit. And if you're a person like Matthew, when Jesus comes to you, his first thought is, I got to invite all of my outcast friends to a party and introduce them to Jesus. This is where it covers every person. They're all of great value. And Paul says, get uncomfortable. Get uncomfortable. Put yourself against those that nobody wants to be with and say, you know what? God made you. God created you. And I love you. And it will be uncomfortable. One of my favorite stories is a pastor who went on a mission trip. He was way out of his comfort zone. We always like to say, out of my comfort zone. He's on a comfort zone and, and um, he doesn't know what's going on. He can't speak the language, but there's a missionary there who's helping translate. And the missionary says, we're coming into this village and there's a matriarch and it's really, really important in this context that you show respect to this matriarch. If you don't, we're going to lose this open door to the gospel. So make sure that you show great respect. How do I do that? Well, you're, you'll know. We'll ask you to, to do certain things, and that's what you'll have to do. They get in. They, he sees the matriarch. It's not what he thought. He thought maybe like a queen sitting on a chair or something. And it's this elderly woman, and she is dirty, and she smells. He can smell her from feet away. And he says, her hair is scraggly, and she looked terrible. And he, the smell, the odor was something. He said, and I noticed it wasn't chewing tobacco, but she was chewing something that was black because all of her teeth were black, at least the teeth that hadn't fallen out. And it's actually slobbering down her mouth. And every once in a while, she'd spit some out. And she's chawing on this. And he's like, this is the matriarch. And so the missionary said, now here's the first sign of respect. She's going to offer you something to drink. You need to drink this. This is a sign of hospitality, and you're going to respect her by doing this. And the key is that she's going to give you her cup to drink from. And it was just an old, he said, an old tin cup that was kind of beat up. And she, I don't know, he said, I don't know what they put in it. It was some kind of drink. And the whole time he said that she's holding this cup. I'm looking at her mouth, and stuff is just everywhere. I'm like, ugh. I'm going to drink from this cup. I don't know if I can do this, God. But for the gospel's sake, I make myself a slave to everyone. And he said, so I took the cup. And he said, without trying to be too obvious, he said, instead of just drinking like you would, he said, I took it and I thought, probably the only safe place on this cup is as close as I can get to the handle. And he said, so it's kind of awkward, but I took it and I started to drink at the very edge of this handle. I think maybe this is the cleanest spot I can get. And he said, he finished the drink, and then he said, the old woman started just cackling, just laughing. And the missionary interpreted it, and he said, well, what did she say? And she laughed, and she said, oh, pastor, you drink out of the cup exactly the way that I drink out of the cup. <laughs> and that's the kind of experiences that we're going to have. See, because when I come near somebody that makes me way, way uncomfortable, I think God is saying, yeah, this is going to be not only good for them, it's going to be good for you. Because it's going to bring you down to humility that's freeing, just freeing, to share the gospel and make disciples. That's what we're about. Everything that we do, every activity, make disciples. And next week we're going to talk about grow disciples. Make and grow disciples for Jesus. Let's pray.